Thank you all for letting us know. That's really helpful. One of my coworkers couldn't hear online, so. Oh, wow. I'll have to yell down the hall, I guess. <laughs> uh. Okay. I really want to honor all of you who joined us on time. So we're going to go ahead and start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sue Ostoff, and I'm with the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Better Women. Uh, we're located in Philadelphia, and I'll be the host for today's webinar. Uh, before we begin the presentation, let's go over some logistics, and we'll do this as fast as we can. Um, if you have any trouble, try calling iLink support, 800-799-4510. Uh, and one of my assistants for today's webinar, Katita Cavero, you know, she'll type that in. She did already into the chat box. And my other uh, wing woman today is Dot Goldberger, so thanks to both of them for their help. Uh, you can also type your questions into the chat box in the lower left uh, corner of the screen. It looks like most of you already know how to use this. So why don't we go ahead and try it. In the lower left hand of the screen, if you can let us know where you are uh, calling in from today, that would be great. And if you have more than one person at your site, uh, participating in this. If you can also add that, that would be really helpful. What time is it in Hawaii now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. This is really exciting to see people from all over the country, uh, 9 o'clock in Hawaii and bright and sunny. And remember, if any of you have more than one person participating, if you can let us know, that's really helpful. Uh, as you probably figured out, all the participants are muted, so we're going to have to use the chat feature to uh, communicate with one another. And so if you have any questions or problems or comments, please put them there. Uh, we'll be collecting, I'll be collecting the questions during the webinar and we'll pose as many of your questions at the end of Sandra's presentation today. Uh, if you're joining us only by phone and not able to see the chat box and you have questions, please email dot with any questions at dot dot at ncdbw.org, so that's dot at ncdbw.org. We'll be recording today's webinar, and you'll be able to access this on our website in about a week. Uh, I think you also know that we posted uh, today's PowerPoint, which you should be able to save and or print, although I know some people are having some issues with printing. Uh, we also have Sandra's bio up there and a few handouts. The link was in the reminder that came out this morning, uh, and we'll post it again here. Thanks, Katita. Uh, also, at the end of the email, and shortly thereafter, about 15 minutes after it's completed today, we'll send out a little brief evaluation. Uh, the note will contain confirmation of your attendance, and it will also include a link to our posted recordings and a very recordings um, on the, our website and a very brief survey. And if you could do this evaluation, it's really helpful. Your feedback is valuable. It really helps us figure out what other uh, webinars we should be doing in the future, et cetera. So please, um, if you could do that, that would be terrific. OK, we're going to try to see if this, uh, I'm going to try to pull up a little set of questions here. We've had some technical problems. Uh, in the past. Okay, are you seeing those questions? I hope so. The three questions are really, how do you describe your profession? Are you an OVW grantee? And if you are an OVW grantee, what kind? If you're on the webinar uh, system itself and you see those little dots, please go ahead and click on the actual dot. Don't put your answer in the chat box. So how do you describe your profession? If you're a community-based advocate, just go ahead and click that little dot directly to the left of the first answer. So we'll just take a, a minute or so to, to uh, see if people can answer those questions. 
I'm not, are you able to answer the questions? Oh, there they go. Okay. So, again, if you click on the dot, that's really helpful. If your answer is other, then if you could put the other, click on the dot and then put what the answer to the other is in the chat box, that's also very, very helpful. I see some of you are already doing that, so thank you. Uh, right now, it's about 42% are community-based advocates and 21% are other. Okay, we'll give that just a couple more seconds here. And then let me just uh, put up the results so you can see that. I hope you can see that. And we can keep going a little bit. Okay, so Sandra, that gives you a sense of who's on? Yes. Also, you're seeing those mm -hmm. results? Yes, I am. Okay. I am. Great. Now I'm going back to the PowerPoint. Okay. For those of you who just joined us, I'm Sue Ostoff and I'm with the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Battered Women. And I really want to extend a very warm welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us uh, for this webinar. And this one is the ninth in our series of webinars about when survivors reenter their communities after jail or prison. And if you missed any of the other webinars in this series, including one by today's speaker, uh, recordings of the past webinars are up on our website. And before I go further, I just want to take a second to thank really profoundly and profusely the Office on Violence Against Women and the Family Violence Prevention and Services Program of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for the support of this webinar. Uh, we think it's just so great that they're supporting work focused on survivors who are reentering their communities. Uh, as you probably noticed, as I mentioned before, all the participants are muted. And so we're going to be using the chat box to collect questions during the presentation. And then I will pose those questions to Sandra at the end of her presentation. And she's hoping to leave about a half an hour for that. So as you're probably aware, today's webinar is titled Reentering and Reuniting, Incarcerated Survivors of Battering and Their Children. And it really is a true pleasure to get to introduce our speaker today. In an effort to save time, we've put her bio up on the screen and they're in the handouts. Um, and I'll just do a brief introduction, although it's really hard for me to do because Sandra, is, Sandra Barnhill is such an accomplished person. She's just done so much and has so much relevant experience. And so I really encourage you to read her full bio and there's some fuller ones available online. Uh, but what I want to say is that, you know, while her bio says that she's an attorney and she's the founder and president of Forever Family, Inc., which was uh, formerly called Aid to, to Children of Imprisoned Mothers, or AIM, which is a national nonprofit located in Atlanta, Georgia, and it provides direct services programming for children and families affected by parental incarceration. And Sandra's bio talks about her many awards and her many honors. It talks about her education. And it also mentions that she was selected as one of Atlanta's top 100 black women of influence. And I, I said this in the last introduction, but I feel like I want to say it again because it's so true. What her bio doesn't say is that, in my opinion, she should have been selected as one of the United States top 100 black women or top 100 women or top 100 people of influence, especially when it comes to working with incarcerated women and their families. The Ford Foundation recognized Sandra for her pioneering work in this area, and we all should. Sandra became one of my earliest and best teachers, and that was over 25 years ago. And she's really continued to teach me over the years, and she pushes me hard to do my work better, and she's done that ever since I met her. She is all about keeping it real, even when sometimes that is difficult to do. I wish I had more time to talk about how much I love and admire Sandra and the work she does. Thank you so much, Sandra, for all. And we're really pleased and honored to have you join us today. Uh, so if anybody's having trouble still, tech trouble, try iLink support, 800-799-4510. And remember, I'll be collecting questions down there in the uh, bottom chat. And Sandra, like I mentioned earlier, is planning to leave about a half an hour for questions. She really wants to hear from you. So 
Thank you, Sandra, so much for all your great work, and thank you for your willingness to share it with us today. And so without further ado, I'll turn the mic over to Sandra. Well, Sue, it's been my pleasure both to um, work with you over the years and also to participate. This is my second in the series of webinars, and I'm so glad to have the opportunity to be involved. So thank you. My pleasure. If you're just tuning in, let me welcome you to Reentering and Reunited, Reuniting Incarcerated Survivors of Battering and Their Children. I'm um, so grateful to the National Clearing House for being willing to fight the good fight and to support um, survivors as they fight that um, fight. If you are new to the community, I encourage you to visit their website and get to know them uh, even more. If you have been an, a, a member of the community, then you know that they are what we call the real deal. So with that being said, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're going to try to do today. We have an hour and a half together, and I actually am going to try to only talk for 45 minutes to give 45 minutes for, uh, for questions and comments. I really believe that this call is full of wisdom, not just my own, but that of others. And so I want to give an opportunity um, for people to do some sharing. I looked at the list of who's participating, and I'm quite honored that my colleagues, um, allies in this work are uh, on the call, and I honor them. And then finally, before I get started, I want to honor women um, who have survived. So if you are on this call or you're working with folks um, and representing them on this call and you either have ever doubted or they have doubted their ability to survive, then this call is really for you because you did survive and you are moving now in the power of what I call, uh, call a mighty path. And then some people may say, well, it's a painful path. It's Yes, it's all of those things, but it is a mighty past in that you have survived. And when we think about the definition of mighty, and I know there are a whole lot of them, but when I think of that word mighty, I think of something that has great power, strength, is a force. And I think anyone who has survived both battering and or prison um, is mighty. And so I'm happy to be having a conversation today about your reuniting um, with your children. So really the goal is to try to um, unpack three topics today. The first one is to take a look at options for your children during incarceration. The second one is to sort of talk a little bit about what is this whole thing called reunification and the best interest of the child standard and case planning. Third, we want to talk about um, the future because you're already on your way to the future and want to talk a little bit about things to do while you're incarcerated, whether that's jail or prison, and that get you ready to come home. And then after you are released and home, uh, things that you can do. Then I want to move um, immediately into uh, question and answers. That being said, so when we're talking about survivors, who are we talking about? Well, there's some givens, some things that we know. Um, and the number one thing is, unfortunately, about 70% 70 70 of incarcerated women are parents. Uh, most women who are incarcerated have experienced both sexual and or uh, domestic violence. And these women like the vast majority of women who are locked up, are going to come home. They will be released back into the community. And their release has implications for not only them, but for their children, their families, the batterer, and for our community. When we talk about large numbers of women being incarcerated, um, at the end of 2011, so this is 2014, three years ago there were a million women under some type of supervision in the criminal justice system. And so that means that women could have been in jail, could have been in prison, could be on parole or probation, but they are under some type or level of custody um, from the criminal justice system. And that's a large number of women, particularly when women only make up 6% 
of the nation's prison population. There are a whole lot of reasons for that, but I think most of the reasons um, stem from this being a criminal injustice, not a criminal justice system. So when we think about women who are under the state's control, we think about not only them, but their children and their family members who are also under the state's control. A woman may be locked up inside, behind bars, behind the walls. Her children are locked up on the outside um, in our communities, and they oftentimes are really invisible. And when I say they're invisible, I say that because in our society, it's a stigma to have your mom um, be in prison or having done time. And so folks aren't running around and saying, hey, hey, everybody, my mom's in prison. In fact, so often what we see is there is a concerted effort for people not to know that their moms have been or are incarcerated. And so oftentimes the support that's really, really needed is not there. I think part of why I'm so excited with the large number of frontline advocates on the phone um, today or on this webinar, I'm excited about it because I know that they are providing the support um, that's really, really needed. So again, I commend advocates. And what we know both um, through the research and what I know through my 27 years of experience working with women in prison most of the mothers were involved in their children's lives um, prior to their arrest. A little bit different compared to dads, compared to fathers, but most of the mothers had a relationship that included living with at least one of their children prior to um, their arrest. So what we see is a woman busy carrying out her parental roles. So the next topic we want to take a look, a look at, so we're really just painting the picture of what or the profile of an incarcerated mom. I think you know the profile, but we'll go through the last little piece, which talks about um, what has happened to her. While um, there have not been a whole lot of studies done, the ones that have been done um, are sort of, uh, what do I want to call them? They're startling by any any imagination. But if you look at the large government studies, they say about 50% of um, women who are incarcerated had prior abuse. That's startling. But if you look at smaller studies, which are much more in-depth, and they're usually uh, qualitative as opposed to just checking off numbers and you know quantitative boxes, but you really hear the richness of women's voices, they put the number much higher. Some as high as 75, some as high as, sorry, 95%, but most are somewhere between 70 and 90%, and that, too, is, um, is startling. So we have many, many women who come behind the bars um, bringing the weight of um, their abuse with them. And while we don't really know which of the studies you should believe, and they use different kinds of of methodology. I think the large as well as the small studies both indicate to us that two things. One, that abuse is real, that women have experienced it, and two, that we need to do more in-depth studies so that we will have more information and much more accurate results. Well, that's sort of the broad um, outline or the demographical profile of women who come to prison who are incarcerated and have been battered. Some are there because they responded to their batter, or some are there and their conviction had nothing to do with their being battered, but they still have been. And so for whatever reason they are there, what we are talking about today is based on the fact that they have experienced battering. How do we begin to reunite them with their families in a way that is healing both for them, for their children, and our community. In this webinar, we will not talk about um, adoption as one of the options. And the reason that we are not is because I personally and Forever Family um, as well, the agency that I run, we really strongly believe that every woman 
should be able to be reunited with her children. Some require more work, more preparation, more healing than others, but we really don't look at adoption as um, a first option. And when we think about the fact that 95% of folks who are incarcerated are going to be released, they need to be released with their family um, relationships still being present. They may not be as intact as they'd like them to be, and part of the work is rebuilding that, but we really do see this work as women coming home to their children. So with that being said, I want to move now into looking at the options for the child's placement while the mom is incarcerated. And I want to do it in two ways. The first is I want to talk about people, and then the second, I want to talk about process. So um, let me make an overarching sort of statement, and that is this, and I do believe it is becoming more and more true across the country, that there is now a strong presumption in favor of relatives as a possible placement for children whose moms are in prison. Over my 27 years, that has not always been the case, but increasingly, um, we see state after state understanding the importance of the children being connected to relatives. So I wanted to put that out there. Um, and I want to talk first about some things that both the kids think about and things that the mom should think about in terms of placement. So the first thing I want to talk about is, or I want to share, is some of the questions that kids ask us here. And uh, over my 27 years, I've worked with close to 20,000 young people. So here are some of the questions they ask when they find out their mom's going to prison. Well, how can I talk to my mom? How can I contact her? When can I see my mom? Um, who's going to take care of me while my mom's gone? Um, who can I really trust? I mean, who's really going to be on my side? And they sometimes say, this system is so unfair. It took my mom. I can't see her. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, and I often hear when the father has battered the mother, um, kids say stuff like, wow, now my mom's locked up, but how do I get my dad to really change, and is he going to be any different, and is he going to start beating on me? And they also ask questions like, I don't know, how do I react when people hear the truth that, you know, my mom was battered by my dad and now she's locked up? Or how do I deal with these feelings of anger that I have and where can I go to get help? So all of those are real questions that deserve answers that children who have um, incarcerated moms ask. And they're questions to which we, the adults that are in their lives, um, have a responsibility for answering. And so... The first thing I would say is that there needs to be truth-telling. When we're talking about options for the child while the mom's away, truth-telling in that we do not need to say, which I've often heard said, oh, mom is going on a special important mission for the government. She'll be gone away a while. Or mom's in college and she'll come home after she graduates. These are all things that people say um, to avoid what is the painful truth. And if the father has really been the batterer in this case, and if the mom has responded, oftentimes on both sides of the fence, there is an effort to deny um, what has happened, even when the children may have seen it. And so I want to begin again with the people whoever is going to um, show up in that child's life as caregiver, as responsible adult, that person needs to be able to speak a word of truth. Yes, the truth needs to be appropriate in terms of figuring out at the child's developmental level what they can handle, but I definitely do feel it's necessary that the truth be told. So now I want to talk a little bit about, okay, there has to be a responsible adult that takes care of that child. So when we think about that, what things should we think about? The first one, we know that the 
guardian, whether it's the um, caregiver, you know, the um, relatives or some other adult person, they've got to be at least 18. Well, that's the law. But here's a bigger question or bigger factor that I think ought to be in play, and that is this. Whoever the person is that is going to become the caregiver during the mom's imprisonment, that person needs to have a genuine, genuine, I cannot say it enough, genuine interest in the children's welfare. They need to be physically able to um, take on the responsibilities of caring for the children, and they need to have enough time. And if they have their own children, there really does need to be both discussion and um, a deep understanding of what effect their their children, um, what will be the effect of their children having more children come into the home for their parents to take care of. And when I think about some questions that ought to be asked of whoever that potential caregiver is going to be, um, here are some things that I think the caregiver needs to ask themselves, but if they aren't prompted to do so, it really, these are kind of the kinds of questions the um, mom needs to ask them. Um, and the big one for me is do you really want to act as the person's legal parent during the time of my incarceration? That's an important question for a mom to ask because what we see so often, if here in Georgia, most women are incarcerated an average of six years and eight months. Um, and so over that six-year period, we often see multiple placements. The child goes from this home to that home. And really getting clear, can I take care of, can I be responsible for this child or these children during the mother's um, period of incarceration? Do I have the energy? Do I really have the energy to do this? And what effect is it going to have on me, my family, my health, my job, and my life? And some people might say, well, no, don't ask those questions because they might say no. Well, that's a good thing if they say no um, because they're really not ready to take on the responsibility. Better it is that the mom um, know now than to find out later when she's um, locked up and it's much more difficult for her to really help um, the children find another caregiver. Well, those questions being asked um, and the characteristics being laid out, then I want to move to the options. And the first option I want to talk about is the child's father as the custodial parent. Um, if the mother and father were together um, in the home with the children and the mom is incarcerated and she has responded to battering, his battering and gets um, incarcerated, whether she killed him or, um, you know, shot him, stabbed him, did bodily harm to him, one of the things that um, you really have to think about is that father then becoming the custodial parent. What are the issues around that? Will he, um, as we know research says, if the mom is battered um, and, you know, there's domestic violence um, manifested against her, the children are also likely to experience that. Will the father, um, because he has his own anger, fear, and even pain around what happened, will he um, work to keep the children away from their mom as opposed to work to have the children connect with their moms. But this notion of who the children uh, are placed with is really, really critical, and moms have to think through the real tough issues. If she and the children's father were not together but shared joint custody before she got locked up, and now he wants to be, you know, the custodial parent, um, what may have to happen is many, many of the details that um, surround her battering will have to come out. And we're going to talk later about the best interest of the child, and the court looks at that. And it um, may have to um, really be proved that with his history of violence, he is not the best interest, uh, in the best interest or the best person to um, 
care for the children. But the father is an option as the custodial parent, and mom and dad really need to have real talk about what that means. Whomever she gets to be the um, caregiver of the children while she's away, there really does need to be a conversation about, will you bring my children to see me? Um, are you willing to accept the collect phone calls, which is the only way that I can call? And are you willing to keep my memory and the knowledge of me alive for my children? And once those questions get answered, moms are much better able to decide who should care for the child. So we've talked a little bit about the father as the custodial parent. Now let's talk about the whole notion of relatives. I think the little checklist I gave in terms of the factors to think about as well as the questions to ask, those are all the same kinds of questions that need to be asked of relatives. One of the things that we see a lot is relatives who love, love, love the children and who take good care of them but often start having the children call them mom, and really a lot of times they say they begin that because it's easier for the child to deal with school and life um, just to start calling the grandmom or the aunt mom. Um, I don't really subscribe to that. I think it's important for the children to call their mother mother. I think it's important for the child to really understand that in their life, they have two parental figures, mom, big mom, grandma. And coming out of the African-American tradition, which is also the tradition of many other cultures, it is not unusual to have relatives raise children. And so oftentimes when we uh, begin to call the caregiver mom and we build up a whole story around that, as the child gets older, it becomes diff more difficult for them to maintain it or to want to maintain it. So I think there's a real need, again, they're not the mom, they are a loving, caring family member and whatever that relationship, grandmom, aunt, big mom, or whatever they call her, that's who they are and that's the role that they're playing. One of the things that often um, happens with kinship care is that there is a primary relative who takes on the official legal responsibility for the children, but there are other family members who help out. We really support that system, and it really does provide um, a network of support for the child, and that's a good thing. But all of those people, all of those relatives, have got to be clear about their role, and they've also got to be clear about the mom's role and that the um, the goal is for mom to come home and to be involved in her children's lives. If there has been battering um, by the father, then all of those relatives, particularly those who are on his side of the family who may not believe that he's beat her, who may feel she deserved it, who may have all kinds of myths built up around their good son, um, they have got to come to an understanding of um, the fact that the child doesn't need to hear all that pro propaganda, does not need to hear, well, you're, he beat her because she deserved it and that's why she's locked up. And So both sides of the family, all of the relatives have got to come together and have got to um, agree about how we best support the children, but I am a strong, strong proponent of kinship care. The next um, option I want to talk about is legal guardianship, and that is um, really, really important. I want to talk a little bit about how um, you go about that. Temporary legal guardianship is just that, a legal process, which means that you go through the court. In many of our families, what we see is that family members are informally taking care of the children. Grandma has them or the aunt has them. There hasn't been any formal legal document um, that's been signed or taken you know, into court to get um, notarized or, or to get the formal process going, in other words. 
but we really feel strongly that it is important to have a legal guardian. It makes many of the transactions that have to occur for the child much easier. And then that adult has a level of authority um, in terms of acting on the child's behalf while the mom is away. But what has to happen, though, is before a guardian can be appointed, there's got to be a consent on the mom's part to relinquish, to give up temporarily her parental rights. And one of the things that happens is because those rights are temporarily given up, when the mom comes home, the guardianship, guardianship ends, and the mom is then back as the um, guardian. So really, a, a legal guardian is just a, um, a substitute, really, for the parent. That person is responsible for the child's day-to-day -day care and for their, product, their protection. They get to consent to important stuff like if the child's hospitalized or needs emergency medical treatment, you know, the guardian can give the consent for that. They sign report cards and school papers and um, really they act or have the same level of authority as if they were the parent over the child. So, and in many um, respects, the guardian has to be able um, to financially care for the child. And while the parent, the law says the parent still has the resp responsibility to provide financially in terms of some support, it's important, though, that the guardian be able to provide um, support for the child or is willing to get public assistance to provide support for a child. So generally what happens with the guardian is um, it's a process that takes place in probate court in the county where the child is residing, where that child is living. Um, and really the most important thing is that you're going to have to fill out a petition or paperwork for each of the children. And one of the things that the mother will have to have decided is who she wants the guardian to be. And then that person obviously has got to agree to be the guardian and there will be a judge who will appoint them and say that they are assuming the responsibilities for the um, parent in terms of the child's care. And I have also seen cases where um, judges have removed guardians, particularly if they've been um, neglecting the child's welfare. So that's why it's important to make sure the person that you choose is able to um, act in that way. And so when you um, think about having somebody be a guardian for the child, one thing I didn't say earlier, a factor, is um, how does the child feel about it? Here in Georgia, if the child is 14, they actually get a say in selecting um, their guardian. I'm not sure if that is the case in all states, and people can check for their particular state, but the child at 14 gets to say who they want to serve as their guardian. Now the judge has to approve that, but the child really does have um, a say in it. And I also want to just underscore this, because legal guardianship is a process for which you must use the court system, when a mom comes home, when she's released, um, and she wants to care for her children again, the guardianship, um, the temporary guardianship has to be um, voided, it has to be terminated, and a petition has to be filed for that. And I want to say how important it is during the time that the mom, and we'll talk about this in detail later, during the period of the mom's incarceration, it's very important that she interact with the guardian, that she's clear about the fact that she plans to come back and take control and parent her own children. Sometimes um, guardians get attached they love the children, they love them deeply, they love them fiercely, and sometimes they don't want to let go or they feel like they might be um, a better parent. Whether they think that or not, the fact of the matter is that they have temporary guardianship, and so when the mom does come home, um, she needs to file a petition to terminate the temporary guardianship so that she can move into her rightful place as parent. However, 
if the guardian, the person that, and that's why who you choose is so important, if that person has decided, hey, I think I want to keep the kids, they can file an objection to that petition for terminating the guardianship. And if that happens, then the probate court isn't going to deal with that matter. They're actually going to transfer it to juvenile court for that court to make the final decision. Usually what the juvenile court judge will do is to um, – appoint a um, guardian ad litem, and that person, their whole goal, the person, that attorney's goal is to really try to figure out and represent what's in the best interest um, of the children. So, again, early on, consent to have select a guardian with whom um, you can communicate because it's in your best interest and the child's best interest if you and that guardian can work together because it um, helps to avoid um, a lot of fights down the road. The fourth um, option that I want to talk about is foster care. Oftentimes, if the mom is arrested and the child is or children are with her, there's no relative who can come and get them. Um, you know, they actually get taken uh, here in Georgia down to emergency, um, you know, child custody. And DFACS, the Department of Family and Children's Services, gets involved. And so the children become temporarily placed in the custody of the state. And then um, if the um, family members, if no one is able to take the child, then a deprivation process will begin, and that starts in juvenile court. And so what ends up happening is that the state comes in and begins to um, take control of the family, and the child is placed in foster care. And then they're either pay placed with the foster family or foster parent or in a group home um, environment. And so one of the things that um, often happens is as soon as the child is placed in temporary state custody, they will be assigned a caseworker. And that caseworker will be responsible for creating a plan that spells out for everybody, the parents, defects, the caregivers, um, what it's going to take to reunite that mom with her children. And so what we often encourage moms to do, particularly if you know that, you know, um, you're about to be arrested or if you have been arrested, you're in the jail, you haven't had your trial yet, but it's to get busy figuring out who you want to take responsibility for um, your children. So we've talked some about the options. The child's father is one. But it's very important, particularly if um, he was the child's batterer or the mom's batterer, that all of those issues around his violent behavior um, is addressed. The second, of course, is kinship care, having a relative um, or relatives work together with one lead relative, um, taking responsibility for the children, legal guardianship, and foster care is an option. Here in Georgia, and it may be different in other states, but here in Georgia there's sort of an unspoken um, kind of comment, and it's this one. If your child becomes a ward of the state, if your child gets into foster care and state control, it's very, very hard to get them back. And we've seen women go years and years after their release not being able to get their children back. And that's because when the case plan is created, oftentimes the um, case plan is not realistic. And there are hurdles that are placed on the mom that are um, burdensome and make it difficult to reunite with her children. So one of the things we often um, encourage people to do is to be very, very active in the development of the case plan. So. Generally, if your child is placed in foster care, within the first 30 days, um, the caseworker has to develop a plan that outlines what's going to have to be done in terms of that child um, returning um, to the home. And one of the things that 
parents, um, incarcerated moms, want to make sure that they do is both look at the case plan and respond to the case plan. Now, the way it works is that the defect worker creates the plan, but it must be reviewed and approved by a judge. And once the judge has approved it, then it becomes the document that governs the relationship with mom and child and in terms of what's going to have to happen to get them reunited when the mom is released. So it's very important that the mother, if she disagrees with anything in that plan, that she shares that information with the judge. And she has a right to be present at the hearing. The fact that she's incarcerated in the county jail or in the state, one of the state prison facilities, does not take that right away from her. She still has the right to be present. And one of the things that she'll want to do is to write the judge. It can be a simple letter saying, you know, I know you're hearing the matter regarding my children. I would like to be present. And once she has written the judge, it then becomes the judge's responsibility to make sure that um, she is able to participate in the, um, you know, hearing where the um, case plan is going to be approved. And the way it's normally set up is that once the judge has approved, approved the plan, and it's important to make sure that visitation is covered in the plan. And defects workers um, are supposed to take children to actually see their um, incarcerated parents. And many of them try to unite with agencies like Forever Family, the one I run, because we do visitations, um, so that then they, the children get to go down with other kids on a visit. But if there isn't an agency like that in your local community, the caseworker is still responsible and still required to make sure that the child does have visits with their incarcerated parent. Well, anyway, once the plan is created, the judge has approved it, then the judge and um, the caseworker are going to monitor the plan. And in fact, the judge is going to want to, um, and the law um, requires that at least every six months that plan comes up before the judge and it's um, reviewed, and it's almost like an evaluation tool. And so it's really important that the mom know about the hearings and the meetings that are going to be held relating to um, her child's case plan. And I've said it once before, but I cannot say it enough. Um, moms have a right to be there. One of the um, things that I want to share, and it's this, it is so important that moms cooperate with the court, with the judge, and with the caseworker. And cooperation involves, one, trying to attend all the court hearings, um, but then it is also about cooperating making sure that you respond to a request for information, that you um, don't engage the caseworker only from a place of hostility, because all of that affects um, what will happen to your children. I want to go back a minute, too. In the development of the case plan, if the children, along with the mother, had been um, you know, physically abused, by the father, that is information that the mother wants to make sure um, is detailed and known to the judge so that issues around visitation can be addressed for the children with their father. It may be that this, the visitation with him can only be supervised visitation. Um, he cannot come and pick the children up and have them, you know, um, without any other adult present. It may be that the visitation can only be in the caregiver's home with them present, or it may be that they may have to go to a visitation center and have the visits there um, so that he can be observed in terms of his, um, his behavior towards the, um, the children. Well, I want to now take a look at the whole best interest of the child and what does that really, really mean? Well, what it's supposed to mean, and often doesn't, it's supposed to mean that the happiness, the emotional well-being, the safety, 
of the child is paramount, and it's much more important than anything else. A lot of times, though, that best interest standard does not get upheld, and it's critical that it really, really does, that that becomes the focus um, of every action, whether that be who the child um, lives with in terms of that temporary guardianship, whether it be in terms of visitation with the mom, all decisions need to really have ultimately as the goal to really um, focus on the child's security, their happiness, their mental well-being, and their emotional development so that they be, grow up to be um, positive, powerful um, adults. So when we think about that standard, what I know to be true is that children need a relationship with their parents, and they particularly need a relationship with their mom. And so when we think about that best interest standard, then we have to say how, what needs to be done to make sure that the children can maintain a relationship with the mom. And I think some of that is that the court needs to look at factors of um, whomever the child is going to be placed with. Are they really going to make sure that visits happen? Um, are they going to be able to um, deal with the emotional um, needs and issues that arise from my child and not become excessive in their discipline or um, emotionally or even physically abuse the child. And so the court wants to look at all of those factors when it's trying to make a decision. The other thing that we um, know to be true is that when there's a custody conflict, for instance, if the mom, um, again, was battered by the father, she's responded to that and her response got her locked up, um, we know that there is going to be a conflict around custody. The father may want the children not to have any relationship or any interaction with the mom, and the mom may want, because he is violent, for the children not to be with him as well. When that kind of custody conflict is going on, the judge is even um, more determined, I think, to take in the best to use the best interest of the child standard. And so what has to happen is that um, the factors that will help him determine what's in the child's best interest have really got to be um, brought forth. And so, again, of course, it's the wishes of the children, but there has to be disclosure about the mental health of the parent, uh, particularly the one that has been abusive. Um, there has to be um, information brought forth if the father's family, and this is often um, true if he is deceased and may have, um, you know, been killed when the mom responded to his battering of her, um, the attitudes of the family, his family towards the children and towards the mom, and whether or not the hostility is so strong that it would interfere with the mom maintaining a relationship with the child. One of the greatest tools that um, women who are incarcerated have um, is their story and the ability to tell it. And they may not be able to always be in court to articulate it there in person, but they can use the pen. Um, by writing their story, sharing what has happened, so that the judge has a deep understanding of who they are, what they've gone through, and what their children have gone through. And um, particularly if the father has abused uh, them, what they have gone through at the hands of the father. And if that information can come forth, then the best interest of the children um, will be a standard that hopefully can be upheld by the judge because he has full facts in terms of what um, has really happened in their lives, what might happen, and what he must in his role as protector or she must in her role as the judge protector um, make sure um, happens when there's planning going on for the placement of the children. 
Well, we've talked a lot about the options, about the case planning, about the best interest of the child. And as we get ready to wrap up, I want to talk some about the future. From the moment a woman gets locked up, she's moving forward into her future. And so it's really important while women are incarcerated that they stay connected with their children. They have got to communicate both written, verbal, and face-to-face. Written is extremely important. Drawings, cards, particularly if the child is too young to read, it's important. You're building a record that, um, unfortunately, you may have to use if the other parent or even a guardian that's not a relative um, tries to keep the children when you come home. So it's important that you write letters, that you send drawings, and you keep a record of it. Phone calls and video visits are great, but they're also expensive. Face-to-face visits, they help you um, get your child ready for when you're going to come home. And um, some prisons have children's center, children centers that are child-friendly. Some don't. If you're in, a woman is in an institution that does not have a children's center and the visitation is in the gym, Still visit. Prepare your children for what they might see on the visit, but still visit. And I think one of the other things that's really important, what if there's a woman who has a six-year bit, she's in year four, and she's just now really healing to the point where she's ready to have visits and to really begin to engage with her children. Is it too late? Nope. It's never too late. Whenever a woman moves to the place where she has healed enough um, to begin to look at all of her possibilities, that's the moment that she begins. Um, You know, you may have been listening to this uh, webinar and thinking, yeah, okay, this is great, but everybody I work with, they never did any of this, so what good is it doing me? A whole lot of good because when we know better, we do better. So if you are working with women who have not done any of these things, Please, please share this information with them and say from this moment, right now, today, which of these things can we begin? And that's the most important thing. Knowledge is power, and once women have knowledge, then they can begin to um, make changes and can be very honest about it. Sometimes when women go to prison, The time does them. There's a saying, do the time and don't let the time do you. Well, sometimes the time does do them until, again, they are healed and in a place where they can really begin to work this time. And um, once they get to that place, then we need to, as advocates, have information ready and um, accessible for them so that they can begin to do things differently. I want to talk about... uh, When you're locked up, you do need to plan for your reentry into the community, but that plan ought to include reuniting with your children. And I say that because in many ways, systems are set up so that you won't plan on reuniting. Many women go out and go into community-based transitional um, centers and houses that don't even allow them to bring their children. Their children cannot live with them there. If a woman is in that situation, she had to have a place to parole home to. She wants to come home. She's gotten out, but the house that she's in will not allow her children to live with her. Deal with it by saying, okay, my children can't live here, but can they come here? What things can we put in place if they can't even come there for me to have two hours a day or a week or whatever they can work out to visit with their children. Every step of the way, women need to make it known. This system may not be set up for me to reunite with my children, but I have every um, desire and every plan to do that. And finally, prepare your children and family for your return. A lot of times we um, are so guilt-ridden about what has happened in our lives, the mistakes that we've made, that we make all these promises that we cannot keep. And maybe what really needs to happen is women need to say to their kids, I'm coming home, I've been gone five years, I've been gone 20 years, I've been gone three years. Um, 
I know things are different on the outside now. When I come home, I'm going to have to adjust. I am committed to you. I love you. I plan for us to be together. It may not be my first day. It may not be as soon as I get home, but that is my plan. And every day that I am home, I am going to be working towards getting you back and being reunited with you. And some of the steps that I'm going to have to take is I'm going to have to get a job. I'm going to have to find um, housing that will accommodate us as a family. Children love their parents. They love their mom. They want her to come home. They've done this time with her. What they need to know is that, yes, mom is coming home, but there is no magic wand that will be waved and we'll be back together the next minute. Sometimes the mom will parole home or if she's maxed out will come home and live with the caregiver if it's her mom or aunt or whatever and in those cases the mom needs to say to the kids hey i want you to be prepared for me coming home when i get home you know both your auntie and i are going to be you know parenting you together and she's still going to tell you what to do and i'm going to tell you what to do sometime but she and i are committed to working together for you um, in terms of making your life better. So I need you to be willing, you know, to um, work with both of us. Or mom comes home and dad, who um, was her batterer, is in the kids' lives, and she's got to say to the kids, you know, um, your dad and I are now going to have to work together. Um, and these are some of the things that are going to have to happen. You know, he's going to be visiting with you, and, you know, I'm going to be staying in the home, and so you guys may have to go to another place, either to auntie's house or to a center, and meet dad there, and he'll return you there, and then I'll come pick you up. But it's about being honest with the kids at a level at which um, they can handle. And that takes me to the final piece around um, mom is playing, done all this work in the in, on the inside, the inside of the prison and the inside of herself. She's been released, and she's home. The first thing that she has got to do is focus on stability, and um, that stability is going to mean she's got to have a good relationship, a positive one with whoever the caregiver is, whether it's the husband that's battered or the father that's battered, it's the paternal grandmother who doesn't like her, it's the cousin who really wants to keep the, get, the kids, whoever that person is, she's got to build a relationship with them. And then she's got to talk to them about economic, her own economic support for the children. She's going to be working and will provide for them and help provide for them. And she's got to continually interact with her children even if she's not living with them. And she's got to really, really hear them, listen to their anger, their fear, their pain, um, and be able to stand up under her children's rejection because they may initially reject her. Um, there's a lot of pain and a lot of anger that they may not have had a place or a space to work through, but when she comes home, they let her have it. Well, she's got to be able to understand that. She's also got to be honest with them about why she went to prison. If she did kill their father because he had abused her, she's got to be honest with that about the kids. And they've got to be willing um, to get counseling and work through all of that. And she has to constantly talk about her plans for being in their life now and forever. And that's what the, um, the kids really need to know, that she's going to be there. And creating a reunification plan that they get to see and hear about that is realistic and allows her to, when she is ready, assume full responsibility for the children and, um, you know, deal with the caregiver and take it slow. And I say take it slow and don't rush the process because I so often see women make, and it comes from um, a good place, make all kinds of promises for the future because we want a hope and a future with our kids, but it has got to be realistic and it's going to take time. It took time on the inside and it's going to take time 
when mom comes on the outside. Well, we're about um, four minutes, five minutes um, after my ending time. I wanted to stop at four to give people 30 minutes, but now you've got 25 minutes to um, make comments or ask questions. I um, hope this has been helpful for you, and I'm willing to respond to any questions um, you might have. I believe Sue is going to lead us through the process. Thank you so much, Sandra, for all mm -hmm. that really incredible information. Uh, you know, I have to say that one of the things we hear all the time is that reentry starts the day the day the person is incarcerated, right? Mm, that's true. And it's really clear from what you shared today that reunification really starts at the point of arrest. Mm -hmm. I mean, really profoundly, and I I thought you really were uh, made very powerful points about that. And I also just want to say it was just incredibly helpful to hear you give examples of what women might actually say to the kids as mm -hmm. they are getting ready to transition back about really setting up realistic expectations. And I, I was really moved by the truth-telling part mm -hmm. um, that you started with and kind of ended with as well and just the importance of you know really open communication. So thank you for those um, yeah. really important points. Uh, there's a couple questions here, and then I had a couple myself, but let me start okay. with the ones from the participants. Uh, Ariel asked, mm -hmm. if there's no family or other guardians, is foster care the only option? Well, yes and no. Uh huh. Um, you have to leave someone with someone, a responsible adult, um, in the care of your children. If you don't have anyone, then yes, the foster care will become your only option. But one of the things that I see a whole lot is um, folks limit themselves in terms of who could be um, a guardian for their children. And when I say limit themselves, what I'm speaking of, if there aren't any family members who could, if there isn't a, a next door neighbor. But sometimes it's thinking about who have I, um, worked with, who have I been um, maybe not close friends with, but who have I known? Um, have I, over the course of my adult life, been involved either with any kind of a group or a church um, to think through who might be able to take care of the children? But the fact does remain, and I don't want to sugarcoat it, if you do not have anyone, your child will become um, a ward of the state. Thank you. Uh, and Catherine asked, which is kind of a hypo, mm -hmm. so let, let me read what she wrote. If a parent who gets out has a history of abuse to their partner and even to the kids, how difficult can it be to argue that visitation, supervised visitation, is in the best interest of the child? This question is obviously for parents who didn't do the kind of preparation that you, Sandra, are talking about lost touch with the children, and want to be able to reconnect and visit. And then she continued, in this hypo, the kids aren't adopted out. Well, I think a couple of things have to happen. The first thing is that the mom has got to go to work inside. That means her signing up for any courses that are um, offered around um, DV, battering. Um, She's got to get busy herself inside to begin to address and look at that behavior. If the institution that she um, is incarcerated at doesn't have anything like that, when she comes home, probably her first step should be to get support for herself around her violent behavior and to begin to address that because it puts her in a better position to have visitation supervised or otherwise with her kids. But um, every jurisdiction is different, but um, one of the things that we see a lot here are judges feeling, yes, the child does need to have interaction with their parent, but if there has been abuse, that parent um, can only have supervised visits, and that parent must be um, in some form of classes to deal with their battering and their behavior. So I think the thing might be for the woman to begin to address the behavior if she can on the inside. She doesn't have an avenue as soon as she comes out beginning to hold herself accountable for her behavior and then bring that to the table when she talks about visitation. That makes sense. That's really helpful. Um, 
One of the things that struck me when you were talking is you were talking about the need for everybody to really be clear about their role, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of stuff about role clarity, and really not to trash talk the person mm -hmm. who's incarcerated and to be respectful and to really keep their eyes on the ultimate goal, which is some form of reunification with the incarcerated parent, the mother in this case. Uh, I mean, wow. I mean, even in like the best of circumstances, a lot of that's really hard to do. <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering if, you know, that isn't happening, if there isn't clarity of role or there's a lot of, you know, talking down or talking trash about the person who's incarcerated, et cetera. I mean, do you have suggestions for kind of intervention strategies? Yeah, I have um, several. So the first one is that the mom has got to use her personal power, and she's got to um, deal with it head on, either in person with her kids when they visit or in a letter. You a know. letter to? The children. But and through. saying, uh -huh. um, you know, Johnny, a lot has happened that brought me here to prison. I know you don't understand everything, but you're probably going to hear a lot of things uh -huh. said about me. Some of them are going to be good, and some of them are going to be not so good. What I want you to focus on is, you know, your relationship with me. I'm willing to be honest about everything in my life. Um, I mean, she just has to put that out there because, yes, they are going to hear it. And she's going to have to say, um, you know, grandmom or whoever it is that's going to be, like if it's the um, father's um, family, they love you a lot. They care about you as, you know, I care about you. We see things differently, so you are going to hear a whole bunch of stuff. But what you've got to be able to do is judge for yourself. See, kids don't have all the filters that we have. It's like when um, a child meets uh, an adult and they immediately um, want to get away from the adult and the adult hasn't even done anything or said anything to them, but their energy lets the child know, danger, danger. Uh -huh. Kids are very, very smart. So part of what mom has to do is help the child, right, begin to filter synthesize some of all of what they're hearing and say, I don't want you to judge grandma because she said that, you know, or say, I'm not, you're not going to ever hear me say anything negative about your dad. I do, though, want you to be safe. And here's some behavior that you might see that is not safe behavior. And when you see that, here's what you need to do. You need to tell an adult. You need to, you know, leave the room. I mean, those are the kind of things that the mom can do in person when the child comes for a visit, which is why visits are important. And there are also things that they can write to the child about. They can, when they call home, talk about that. And then the next thing they need to do is to, um, particularly, it's easy, obviously, if the child is living with the mother's relatives or someone the mother has selected. They need to have an adult conversation and say, hey, you know, I never got along with that side of the family even before all this happened. It's even worse now. I know that they're going to tell the kids all kind of stuff. What I need you to do is not spend a lot of time, you know, trash talking about them with the kids, but I need you when the children come home from a visit or a weekend with them and they're despondent and they're, you know, all upset, I need you to create a safe place where they can tell you what they've heard, and you can help explain it and unpack it to them. I, um, I don't need you to go off the handle and act all crazy, you know. I need you to really be in a space where you can say to the child, well, when, um, you know, there was a struggle or issue between your mom and dad, you know, it got physical, and your dad, you know, got hit or he, you know, got shot or he got whatever it ha whatever happened, Um and so his family and he, they have feelings about that. And we know we don't want anyone to be hurt. I mean, again, children need us to help them interpret the world in which they live um, so that once we begin to help them break it down to their level and then they can begin to um, take part, parts of it in and begin to understand. And that's just so, so key. So often people tell kids all these crazy lies and, they're going to go to school and they're going to hear, you know, oh, your mom shot your dad. I heard he was beating her down and she just shot and killed him. 
they're going to hear all that stuff. So telling them some crazy stuff that doesn't even make sense, that doesn't connect with reality, does not help. That's helpful, Sandra. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that also really stood out for me is that uh, the age of the kid at the time of incarceration and also the length of the mother's incarceration is surely are incredibly significant in this whole process. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have are there particular tools that are you know created for uh, kids of a certain age, you know, age appropriate materials or ways of helping both uh, advocates and incarcerated women think more strategically about ways of communicating with their children at different stages? Yeah, I think there are a couple of things. One, um, the first would be moms understanding children's developmental levels. When a child is eight years old, it's very important for them to see their parent as leader, as being in charge, right? Um, and so when the child comes to visit, mom needs to talk about why she can't go to the vending machine, right? Because that's keeping her power. And yeah. so as the children develop, you know, mom needs to be able to both help them understand and understand herself. So when um, a child reaches 16 or 15, what we know is that their peer group becomes all important, and they really want to make choices, and they want much more freedom. So mom can't get mad if, you know, um, Bobby does not want to come to the prison every Saturday and visit her, or if Bobby is in sports and the games are on Saturday and he can't come to the prison because he wants to be able to go to the pet rally and, you know, get to the um, field early, all of that. And so part of what mom has to help the kids um, ne negotiate and really navigate are the different um, phases of their lives, right, of the child's life, and say, you know, it's okay. I know that your friends are really important to you. I might not see you as much. You know, you might not be able to come and visit as much because you're in Boy Scouts or Cub Scouts or whatever you're in. But guess what? Mommy needs a letter from you. Um, I need you to tell me in that letter kind of what you guys did at the Boy Scout troop meeting. So... It's really about helping the kids deal with what are natural, you know, feelings. And um, I think that's helpful for them, and it's also helpful for her. So I think that's one of the big things. And then the second thing is the mom has to work with the caregiver to encourage them to use the tools that are available. Um, Sesame Street put together a little video and some handouts um, for yeah. children of incarcerated parents. I've reviewed them, and... I think they're a great starting point, a great starting point. And uh, you can go on their website. Yeah. Um, uh, Dot or Katita just, Katita just put up the link. Uh, good. Sandra, Thea just put that up. Oh, good, and okay. I just wrote, Thanks, Thea, great resource. Mm -hmm. There <laughs> they are. Agree. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's a really helpful resource, and thanks, Katita, for putting that up. There are some good books out there that should be used. One is called um, When Andy's Father Goes to Prison. It's a little book that can be read to the child. There, uh, Andy is a little, um, I believe, it's been a while since I read it, but I think he's a little Latino boy. Uh -huh. There is Visiting Day by Jacqueline Woodson, which tells the story of a young black girl who goes with her grandmother to visit her father in prison. These books, um, which can be read by the family, um, you know, if the child can read, they can read them. If not, the caregiver can read it out loud. They become a way to talk about this issue without even saying your dad this or your mom or what you feel when you go on visits. But the story can be read, and then, you know, the grandmother, um, you know, or whomever is reading it can say, um, you know, wow, Andy didn't want his friends to um, know that his dad was in prison. Why do you think that? Or Andy, um, his mom decided that they were going to move closer to the vis prison so they could visit um, their dad um, more often. How do you think Andy felt about that? How would you feel about that? So there are a lot of tools that can be used that are out there now. Um, and actually, if you go to um, the, um, I believe it is, uh, Family and Corrections Network, they have a resource clearinghouse um and they have a whole section on books, and I believe uh -huh. they're age appropriate. You know, they tell you what ages they are. They that's are great. And and thank you, Katita and Dot, for getting up the Amazon Good. direct. 
uh, <laughs> sites for the, the two uh, books that Sandra okay. uh, mentioned. So you can go forth and order directly <laughs> from, the, from the webinar. So excellent. Um, we had two other questions from uh, participants. One is from Heather, and she's in Canada. She just wrote in Edmonton, Alberta. And she asked, are you aware of any agencies operating here in Canada that are similar to Forever Family? No, I don't know of the, any. Um, I think uh, one good way, or one, you know, is, and you probably already um, have done this, but just um, connecting with people who do prison work in your community. And oftentimes that um, is the um, faith community. And a lot of times they don't have nonprofits, but they have part of their prison ministry, um, you know, working with the children and families of the incarcerated. And that might be a way to start finding out who uh, does that work. And if you find that there is none of that, then, you know, it just may be um, your role to start that. And you can go on my um, Forever Families website. There's a lot of information there under resources about how, um, you know, you can use our model and how we can work with you. Um, so that might have to be the answer. And Heather, also, I don't know if there's an Elizabeth Fry Society mm -hmm. in Edmonton, but, you know, you certainly can go to the, uh, the, the one that's in Ottawa and mm -hmm. get information about work with incarcerated women from them. So, uh, Barbara asks, Many women in prison are there because of behaviors associated with addictive and or psychiatric disorders, frequently untreated or undertreated. How do those factors play in? How do those sorry, how do those factors play a role in the reunification process? Well, um, unfortunately they can play a large role. If a woman has been um, on meds while she was incarcerated, then she comes out and there's no plan for her immediately to get connected with social services to get meds, then she may have some episodes and she, um, her mental health um, may really, really deteriorate. And if that happens and she interacts with her children, um, you know, that can be just really, really devastating for them and for her. And so one of the things that we talk to women about as they make their first 30-day plan, what is going to happen in my life the first 30 days that I'm out, it's making sure, um, first of all, trying to leave the prison with enough meds to hold them for a minute, and then um, making sure that they immediately have already, before they've gotten out, found um, you know, a clinic or a center that they can connect with to begin to get their medication. For women who are addicted, um, a lot of times um, if you go back in the community and you're around the old places, the old playgrounds and the old playmates, that those things become triggers. And so women really being committed to going to NAAA meetings as soon as they get home and actually even asking their family to get a list of the meeting places near where they live and the bus schedule so that they can get there. And then the women making a commitment to do 30 meetings in 30 days or if it needs more 60 meetings twice a day, you know, in 30 days. So it really is about understanding that um, if I am going to deal with my addiction, I've got to have a, um, a plan and beginning to put that plan in place before they come home. And hopefully if they can go to a meeting the first day, then they can get a sponsor. And then that's somebody else who, you know, can try um, and provide support. And also for women who um, may have a substance abuse family, um, substance abuse problem, and go home to um, a family where substances, legal and illegal, are widely used and widely available in the home, they've got to think about what is my plan for coping with this and dealing with it. Very helpful. Thank you. Uh, we're winding down here, and before I ask another question, I want to see if any of the participants have any questions. I don't think I missed any of them. Uh, any other questions? There was a question about, uh, let me see. Hello? Uh, any model advocacy programs in jail or prison for moms and survivors? And 
I wasn't sure that was really your area necessarily. Um, yeah, no. And we'll, we agreed to do that offline, but I just oh, wanted good. to toss it out just in case you knew something that mm -hmm. I didn't. Is it okay if I that? ask a question? Hello? I'm sorry? I'm sorry. I didn't know if I was muted or unmuted. I apologize. That's <laughs> I okay. just, you asked if a participant had a question. Okay. I did. I'm, I'm one of the caller ins, not on the, uh, the website. So sorry for meeting you. It's okay. Uh, there, if, okay. Do you have a question? I do. Thank you. Um, my question was um, basically since we're talking about the women being incarcerated mm -hmm. and then what's, you know, what's held accountable for them once they are out, are they incarcerated um, because they went ahead with in, in the situation between mom and dad, they were the violent, they were the batter, and they were locked up, or was this out of self-defense and they're still held accountable? Because you said something like mom comes home but dad was the batter. So is this situation because the mom, you know, really took it pretty far by maybe they shot at dad or what, like to focus on the moms for this one, for the women, what could they have done or what did they do to be held accountable for this? So I think there are, um, well, thank you for the question. I think there are a bunch of different um, scenarios that are at play. Mm -hmm. Okay, one mm -hmm. scenario, obviously, is that the woman um, has been battered and she responds to him, and her response is to physically um, stop him from battering her, either through killing him, shooting him, mm -hmm. knifing him. or So that's one um, scenario. Mm -hmm. And if she is in a state that doesn't, you know, um, really um, honor, acknowledge battered women's syndrome and all that kind of stuff, then, right. um, you know, she may be locked up. But she could also be a woman who has been beaten and beaten for many, many years, and she flees and, you know, leaves and takes the kids. And to survive, she steals, or maybe to deal with all of that, she does get addicted and then her, um, you know, oh, habit. Okay. Um, moves her to steal or to do things, to sell drugs. So there are a lot of different um, scenarios. Right. And every woman who's locked up, I mean, there are a couple of things. First of all, every woman who gets locked up isn't guilty because innocent people get locked up every day. Um, right, right. <laughs> so it could be that. It could be that she's locked mm -hmm. up and her charges have nothing to do with her having been abused, but that abuse does have an effect on her. Okay. I see what you're saying. Okay, so say maybe she got picked up for a warrant, mm -hmm. and then it just so happened she didn't take care of this warrant because, you know, hey, she's been out of the household anyways on a run from her abusive husband with her kids, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. something like that. Okay, I see what you're saying. There's different elements to where she was. Okay, I got you, got you. Okay, thank you for that. I appreciate you. That's awesome. Thank you. We have another question here, and I'm not sure we're going to have time to give it justice, so I'll quickly um, ask it, and if you don't have time to answer it, we will um, ask for a closing um, statement if you have one, and then we'll, we will end. But um, Rochelle asks, if released and placed on parole or pro probation, what are some of the functions of parole and probation officers in reentry and reuniting? Oh, that's a great one to end with. <laughs> Well, hmm. the first responsibility that they should have is to try and help a woman succeed. And if a wo woman is a mother and wants to reunite with her children, part of her success is getting her children back into her life. And so the parole and the probation officers, those are what I call the gatekeepers. They're the people that you have to check in with every week, pee in the cup, pay your money to um, if you have a restitution, you know, or fine that you must pay. So those are the people that you see every week. They can either help you or they can hurt you. They can um, help you stay out or they can hurry up and help you go back. And so it's really important that as women deal with their parole and probation officers, they make um, their desire to be um, a mother and be with their kids, they make that known to the probation and parole officer and talk about these are the things that I'm facing and talk about needing child care, needing all these different things for um, reuniting with their um, family. And part of what these two people are supposed to be doing is to help you find um, and locate resources. So that's part of why they want to um, share that with them. 
and that probably could be another webinar about role mm -hmm. of probation mm -hmm. and parole. So, mm -hmm. Sandra, this has really been incredibly uh, informative and helpful. And I'm just wondering, before we send everybody on their way, uh, do you have any final thoughts or comments that you want to share? Oh, I'd say, first of all, for those folks who are advocates, thank you so much for fighting the good fight, because every day you fight, um, another woman gets closer to claiming her life fully. For every caller, uh, listener, whatever you call it, person that um, signed up and is participating in this webinar, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now you must, you know more, you must act differently, and part of your action must be telling other people about this issue and um, <clears throat> helping them to get connected in ways that can change the lives of women um, and their children. I mean, I think if all of us, once we become aware, refuse to be both silent and refuse to look the other way, we could really, really change things. And so I'm happy that you were on the call, and, and I hope you take um, that responsibility, um, you know, very, very seriously. Our Perfect community ending. depends on it. <laughs> thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse Welcome. me. Thank you. That was great. So thank you, everybody. Um, when you and thank you so much, Sandra. It's really you're great. Welcome. Mm -hmm. um, so what's going to happen is when you sign off, you're going to get this. You should get an instant message about doing this little evaluation, and then in 15 minutes, you'll get another email saying thank you, and it will be the same evaluation. So you only need to do it once, but it would be great if you would do it once. So thank you, everybody. Particular thanks to you, Sandra, and I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See ya. Bye.